Uh, hi guys, my name is uh, Damian Rusinek. I'm a security researcher and a pen tester, and I'm mainly focused on uh, blockchain technology and uh, smart contracts. And last year at OWASP uh, AppSec Europe in London, I gave a talk about the uh, vulnerabilities in smart contracts, and I did a small showcase. But this year, I wanted to focus uh, on the whole process of development of smart contracts and show you how to make it you know, secure. And, uh, well, the first question to you, who have you have, have ever created, I mean, implemented, or maybe used uh, decentralized applications or, or smart contracts? Raise your hand. Just a few people, and I must tell you that this, is, this topic is going to be hot. Uh, quite soon because these are some of the companies, just a small list of the companies that create platforms for smart contracts and decentralized applications and or just use them. And for example, Facebook Libra. Have you heard about Facebook Libra, the cryptocurrency of, of Facebook? Yes. Actually, this is not the cryptocurrency only. It's a smart contract platform. So it is a cryptocurrency, but you can also create smart uh, contracts uh, on, on Libra. So let's start with a quick introduction because the topic is not very familiar. So what are the decentralized applications? And I'm going to call them dApps from now. Uh, and why, why are they becoming so Im important in your future? Well, decentralized applications are like web applications, but they have decentralized storage and governance. So if you, we are looking for an example of web applications, we can go for Facebook or uh, or Reddit, and uh, Steemit is a decentralized uh, version of Reddit, for example. And well, why are they becoming so important? First, there are many projects that have proven its value. Also, the the market is quite huge because there are billions of dollars in cryptocurrencies, of course, uh, on on blockchain uh, market and. Uh, it is, it is also a great chance for new technologies, for, for, for example, for fin fintechs. And as I mentioned before, there are big players behind the, the blockchain technology, the smart, uh, smart contracts, and decentralized applications. But what is so special about decentralized applications? Why do we need them? Why can't we stay with, uh, stick to the web applications? Well, the main thing is that we gain trustlessness uh, thanks to the blockchain technology, which means that there is no single point of authority, no one, uh, no one person or institution can control the application. Also, uh, it means that no one can actually turn it off permanently. That's because anyone can keep the copy locally of any decentralized applications. So if somebody turns off the, the application, anyone else can just put it back online. And it's like, well, it's like having a copy of whole Facebooks, including source code and its database on your computer. So that, that sounds uh, quite nice. Well, what, what's the difference in the architecture between uh, web applications and the apps? Well, the, the original idea behind the apps is that they are kept on blockchain. And I mean both the front-end application, which is usually written in JavaScript, uh, and the API, which is the backend of the application, of this decentralized applications, and these are smart contracts. And all of this is kept on blockchain, on decentralized network that no one can modify and no one can control. Uh, so, also there is a quite popular uh, architecture where the front-end application, so the JavaScript, is kept on a web server, like in web applications. And that's actually okay because still you download the code, the JavaScript code, and you can audit it. You can see it. Of course, sometimes it's obfuscated, but there was a great talk about Lewis, uh, uh, by Lewis about how to automatically uh, scan for, for interesting stuff in uh, JavaScript applications. So this hybrid decentralized architecture is still okay because the main logic, the business uh, logic, the backend is on blockchain still. So are these applications secure uh, comparing to web applications? Well, first of all, they are undestroyable. 
Like I said, anyone can bring it back to life because they're using, they're using blockchain. Then they are cryptographically secure. I'm sure you've seen that two words together many times when you were, you know, reading some uh, descriptions of blockchain uh, applications. So what does it mean? It means that all transactions which represent function calls are digitally signed. So, sounds nice. We have non-repudiation. We have authentication. That's cool. And also, anyone can actually verify the code and the current state of the application because it's all public on public blockchain. So it's like you can read the code. But still, we see many either hacks or great submissions on bug bounty platforms uh, for, for smart contracts and decentralized applications. So again, it's just about the, our expectations and the reality. So I'm, I'm sure that's not going to be a great discovery for you, but what we need, we need a security for decentralized applications the same as we do for uh, web applications. And last couple of months, we've done some uh, pen tests and security audits for companies related to blockchain. And most of them included, of course, uh, web applications that integrate with blockchain. And some of them also included decentralized applications. Mainly the backend of decentralized applications, which are smart contracts. And, well, the case of web applications is quite simple nowadays because we have so many great projects, so many great materials and uh, standards that we can use to perform the audit. And let me ask you, if you need to know what are the most common we uh, web application vulnerabilities, what would you go for? OWASP oh, oh, what? OWASP oh, top 10, of course, yeah, the first answer. Then, if you need a knowledge, uh, knowledge base for the common weaknesses that can happen in web applications. SWE, exactly, common weakness enumeration. And last but not least, I guess the most important, where would you go, what would you go for if you need a security checklist, end-to-end -end list to perform an audit? ASVS, exactly. Application uh, security verification standard. And actually, we can, ask, uh, we can ask the same questions for the centralized applications because this is AppSec, application security. So what's the, what are the most common uh, vulnerabilities uh, for the centralized applications? There is a project which is very similar to OWASP Top 10, which is called DASP Top 10, that enumerates those uh, 10 most popular uh, uh, vulnerabilities. Also, we can uh, look for a knowledge base uh, for the most, uh, for the weaknesses that can happen in smart contracts. And here we have a smart contract uh, weakness classification registry, uh, which is very similar to CVE again. And last, uh, do we have a security checklist that covers whole uh, smart contracts, the whole security of smart contracts? Actually, we couldn't find any. So, uh, well, there are, there is, ver there are very ma many publications, materials about the security of uh, smart contracts, but we couldn't find a checklist that you can, you know, just say that this is passed, this is passed, this is passed. Okay. Our contract is uh, secure for now, at least. So that's why we have created uh, together with uh, Pavel Kurovic from our company, SCSVS, Smart Contract Security Verification Standard. It has very similar form to ASVS because we like ASVS and we use it every day for web applications. And uh, we also have very similar objectives. We want to create a checklist for developers, for architects, and for security reviewers. And uh, also we want to help to mitigate the common vulnerabilities by design and to help to create uh, well, secure code, secure smart contracts. So we have created 13 uh, different categories. The last one is a bit different. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, about it later. And uh, well, they are they have the same form. So they have as as ASVS. So they have the security requirements. They they co all of them contain about 100 security requirements. And I'd like to present some of them. An example on the base of the S SDLC, Software Development Lifecycle, and uh, show you that these requirements cover whole process. And I must say here, that this, uh, there is a disclaimer, this presentation 
It's not about how to introduce security into your SDLC, because that's a huge topic and there are many approaches for that. I'm just using SDLC as the base for examples. So let's start with analysis. Well, of course, we have some similarities between web applications and dApps. And one of them is a threat modeling, which we should perform actually for any kind of application. So that's why we have added uh, security requirements to AVS that makes sure that you first define the boundaries, the trust boundaries in the documentation, and that you perform threat modeling for each functionality that you introduce uh, into uh, smart contracts. Uh, what about the differences? Well, the first difference is about the sensitive data. Actually, this is quite easy uh, for web applications we can, because we can keep sensitive data in a database and we can just protect it. Of course, this is not very easy sometimes, but still the main idea is to keep it in database that is protected. In case of uh, decentralized applications, it's not that easy because all data is on public blockchain. So actually everything is readable and publicly accessible. So that's why you must uh, make sure that no uh, confidential data is kept in smart contracts, in the storage of smart contracts, and uh, like, for example, passwords or, or personal uh, data. And no data is considered safe or private, even if you use a private keyword for your storage variables. This is quite tricky because private variables are not that private. Uh, the next thing, uh, public access. For web applications, it's quite easy to define what is uh, public. We usually uh, publi publish the front-end application and uh, some API. In case of uh, decentralized applications, uh, actually everything is public. So each function that is in the smart contract can be called, can be executed. Of course, the logic may be different. The logic may, may say that, sorry, you cannot execute this function. But anyone can try to execute all functions in smart contracts. And uh, that was the case of the first uh, parity wallet hack, where a function that initiates the smart contract was publicly accessible. And actually, somebody could took over your wallet. And that's how uh, 100, sorry, uh, 30 million of dollars, this is quite, uh, this is variable, right? So today it's 30 million, tomorrow it's 20, and the, the day after tomorrow it's 40. So I need to, you know, update this slide every time I give a talk. So for, for today, it's about 30 million uh, dollars, of course, in cryptocurrencies. So it's important to make sure that all functions have the visibility specified that this was uh, the case of attack just because the, the function was not has not specified the visibility type and by default it, functions are public so that was that was the pro that was the problem next thing randomness well in web applications it's a matter of uh, for one function call either you uh, want uh, statistical randomness or cryptographical randomness in case of uh, decentralized applications it's a bit tricky because smart contracts are executed on many nodes simultaneously so and they must be executed the same way so you cannot use any local uh, parameters from one node and uh, the problem uh, here is that it's not that easy, it's not a trivial to get a random number in smart contracts. And that was the case of uh, a few, of actually many attacks, many hacks. One is quite recent from September, where uh, about uh, $100,000 were stolen from EOS Play uh, application. And uh, one is a bit older. Uh, where about $80,000 were stolen from smart lottery uh, hack, and all that uh, was available because the bad randomness implementation. So you could quite easily, uh, you know, predict the so-called random number. So the solution for that problem is to make sure that you do not uh, generate pseudo-random number trivially basing on the publicly available data 
uh, that is kept on blockchain, like timestamps or block number, etc. Also, decentralized applications introduce some new threats, like uh, threat actors, like for example, miners and validators. These are the nodes that validate the transactions and add new blocks to the blockchain. And they are quite powerful because they can see the transactions before they are validated. So they, they know the future. And uh, here is a case of uh, a report for Augur platform where a miner could easily abuse the business logic of this contract. So he could easily DOS the contract just because some of the logic was uh, based on uh, variables that can be said by miner. And that's how he, and as you can see, uh, the severity of this vulnerability is high. So that's important. So to, to solve this problem, we should make sure that the first, the contract logic implementation corresponds strictly to the documentation and also that we have business limits and we enforce them. And by the way, we must make sure that we, we, the, our business logic does not disincentive users from using our smart contracts. Because if using our application is too expensive for users, they will stop using it. And it's actually also uh, some kind of denial of service, right? Okay, so let's move on to, to design phase. We have some similar, similarities he, here as well. One of them is the risk, le, least privilege rule and the other is access control, which actually in case of decentralized applications is a bit tricky because it's again public, so anyone can see the rules. And that's why it should be kept uh, as simple as possible and centralized in one smart contract. And uh, the least privilege rule can be uh, ensured with the, with the requirement that makes sure the creator of the contract does not have too much power. Because, you know, when you create a contract, when you implement it and then you deploy it, you can say that, okay, I'm the owner, I can do anything. But then you lose the trustlessness, right? Because people have to trust the, the creator of the contract. So the best approach is to create a contract that uh, uh, covers all the business logic flows and that creator cannot change because then it's tr really trustless. And uh, also the access control mechanism should be kept in one smart contract and should, uh, which is trusted and should be, as I said, as simple as possible. Uh, next difference are loops. And I mean the loops that lead to denial of service. Well, we have that kind of loops in web applications. There are usually infinite loops, but it's quite easy to find a loop that potentially may be infinite. In case of decentralized applications, we have some loops that are not, uh, are not uh, infinite, but they are so-called unbound. So there is no specified uh, exact number of iterations. And if we have such loop, we can have a problem because as an example of governmental uh, smart contract, uh, the array that was looped became so huge because of some kind of business logic, be it became so huge that uh, actually you couldn't o iterate over it. And that was uh, the requirement of the business logic. So you had to iterate over an array that, and that would take so much, that would be so costful, it would take so much gas, uh, even more gas than the maximum allowed number. So you actually couldn't call it any, uh, anyway, because uh, you cannot give so much gas. It's more than maximum allowed number. So that's the story how uh, about uh, $200,000 were frozen. It means that they are there, they are on this contract, but you actually cannot do anything with that. So uh, to uh, solve that problem, you can first, first of all, do not iterate over in unbound uh, loops. You must specify exact uh, iterations for each loop. And also to avoid uh, other problems with gas limitation, you should not uh, send funds, I mean the cryptocurrencies, tokens, uh, automatically in your business logic, but you should other 
uh, store the number uh, attached to a person, to an, to an address, and allow those people to withdraw their tokens or cryptocurrencies uh, with another transaction, with withdrawal transaction. And also, we have uh, mm, another case of the risk for decentralized applications, because as you as you've seen, on most of the uh, applications and smart contracts, uh, there are some cryptocurrencies kept. So the more cryptocurrency is on the uh, smart contract, the bigger the risk is that somebody will try to steal it. So you can try to decrease the risk, and you should keep as less uh, amount of cryptocurrencies on the smart contract as possible, because that just does that disincentives the hacker to steal your uh, cryptocurrency. Okay, so let's move on to implementation. Of course, we have great tools like Truffle or Remix. There are, these are IDEs. And they actually perform some security, uh, basic security checks that you can integrate some other platforms that perform some other security checks. But so it's like uh, partially cover, uh, covered. The security is partially covered by these uh, tools, but still we have so many bugs. And it's very, uh, very similar to web applications, right? So the most common, one of the most common uh, vulnerabilities in smart contracts are arithmetic bugs. They are not that common in web applications now. Maybe they are a bit more common in the uh, software that application, web applications use, like servers, uh, where we have overflows. But they are quite common in uh, decentralized applications. And I'm not talking about simple overflows, like, you know, adding two numbers and we, uh, you know, uh, get the number uh, over the over the maximum, I mean uh, so a bit more sophisticated talks uh, uh, overflows uh, where like for example batch overflow or proxy overflow where, and details you can find under these uh, links. But actually, uh, there is a quite interesting co uh, mm, consequence of overflows because if we take uh, an uh, ERC20 smart contract as an example, which is a contract for managing a token, which uh, has some value in fiat currencies like dollars, you can actually, using this uh, vulnerability, create decillions or even more of tokens. So it's like going to the mint in real life, going to the mint, printing like millions of euros and going out with legal money. And if you've seen La Casa de Papel or Money Heist in English, if you've seen this series, I'm sure that you know the scenario of this, of this attack. So to avoid such problem, well, you should make sure that you don't, you are not uh, vulnerable to arithmetic uh, overflows and you can uh, achieve that using, for example, SafeMath library. You should also consider extreme values in your business logic and, uh, you know, handle them. And also, sometimes strict equalities are a bit tricky, so you should avoid strict, uh, strict uh, uh, inequality, equalities. Sorry. <laughs> okay, another difference, recursive calls. Well, recursive calls are quite explicit in web applications because we either, either need a loop or we need to call a function inside, inside the same function. In case of uh, decentralized applications, you actually don't need a loop or you don't need a, and you don't need a f function call in a function to obtain rec recursive call. That's because you can call one contract from, you can call the other contract from the original contract and the other contract will call again your original contract. So we have a loop, but between contracts, not in the business uh, logic of one contract. And uh, that was the case of, I think, the most known attack in the smart contracts world, the DAO hack, where about 3.6 million eaters were stolen, which is like now, I guess, a billions in dollars. And actually, that was the case why the Ethereum platform forked. And now we have two cryptocurrencies, Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. 
Uh, so that was a huge, uh, huge thing. You can find some more details under this uh, link. So, and even this, this kind of attack was got its name. It's called reentrancy. So, if you want to avoid reentrancy attack, you must make sure that no recursive calls from untrusted smart contracts are available in your smart contract. And uh, also, you should check the uh, result of call, uh, of function calls for low-level function like send, call. Because these functions does not bubble up the um, exceptions. Because these functions, when they fail, they just return, uh, for example, zero, like in C language, right? So you should check. You should check the result because if you do not, and you assume that it always succeeds, uh, success, uh, then you might have a problem. Okay, testing. Well. We have also a bunch of great tools for testing for both uh, for both web applications, and there is a plenty of automatic scanners for uh, decentralized applications, and we recommend to use them because why not? You have them, and you can easily just run them. So that's why we have added the requirement to to use these automatic uh, tools, and we've also created a whole. Uh, category just to make sure that the testing takes place on the in the whole process of the development, for, uh, right from the analysis to the uh, to the implementation and deployment, and that's why uh, you should uh, verify the uh, contract uh, logic. You should use the uh, automatic scanners. You should you should also formally verify the specification of the smart contract even before you start to implement it. Right after you design it, you should formally verify it. And also, you should not forget about the manual tests. Because some kinds, uh, some kind of uh, bugs, security vulnerabilities, are hard to find by automatic scanners. And that's actually the same like in web applications. And that's why we recommend to uh, provide SCSVS, of course, and other security requirements and policies to all developers and uh, testers. And uh, talking back about the vulnerabilities that are hard to find, we can talk about the, another submission. F uh, this time it's for MakerDAO uh, platform, and it's again on Bug Bounty uh, platform, HackerOne, where a vulnerability which was in the business logic, so it's hard, it's actually it cannot be found. Uh, it cannot be found by automatic scanners. It allowed to mint uh, uh, Dai, which is cryptocurrency in this uh, platform, uh, without cover. So it's like again minting uh, new money, like printing dollars uh, without you know authority. And as you can see, this bounty is quite huge, and it means that this is this is also a huge problem. It's the severity is high. So. Uh, first, what you should do is to make sure that uh, your business logic is uh, consistent and that, of course, the, it's proceeded in the sequential order. This uh, check is actually very similar to the check from ASVS about the business logic in web applications. Okay, so let's deploy our uh, application. We have implemented it. Now we want to uh, deploy it. And usually deployment means like setting up some configurations, some integrations, and publishing the application. And usually for web applications, we do it once. Of course, we can later redeploy it, but deployment is uh, uh, the process that we perform once. And then there is no uh, logic in the source code of web application that performs the deployment. In case of uh, decentralized applications, you must perform the same process. You must uh, do some uh, configure your smart contract and then uh, set up some uh, connections between contracts and then execute a function that deploys your contract. But the difference is that the deployment function is in the contract, so it's still on the blockchain. It's accessible, so you can try to call it again. And what if, let's say, you forgot to call this function, so you actually didn't initialize the contract or what if you allow to reinitialize your contract because you for well i initialized it 
and I forgot actually to stop other people from initializing it again and taking it over. So that was the case of uh, the second parity wallet hack where uh, there was a smart contract that was shared by hundreds of other contracts and this contract was not initialized. Some guy found out that he can actually initialize this contract. And by initializing this contract, I mean he could took over this contract. So he became something like owner of this contract and he could, he could execute some uh, sensitive functionalities. And one of those functionalities was self-destruct. So he, uh, firstly, he took over, he initialized the contract, he took over it, and then he killed it, like removed it from the blockchain. And the problem was that all other contracts were relying on this contract. And when there is no more uh, the contra the, the core contract, they could not, they could not operate. And the other problem was that there were about 500,000 eaters on this, which is about, uh, today, uh, $100 million. And again, this, uh, dollar, these eaters were fro are frozen actually at the moment. So they are there, but nobody can touch them. So, you know, it's nice to have good money, but if you cannot use it, if you cannot spend it, it's not very nice. So, <clears throat> to avoid uh, such situation, the solution for that problem is uh, making sure that all your variables are initialized, which means that basically your smart contract was initialized during deployment, and making sure that you cannot reinitialize, so you cannot call again the in initialization function. And by the way, in this case, there was that sensitive function, functionality, uh, self-destruct functionality. So you should make sure that you really need such functionalities in your smart contract. That contract did not need self-destruct functionality. Okay, maintenance. Well, uh, when we maintain an application, we of course get some logs. And in case of web, web apps, we keep them safe on the server. Nobody can read them but the administrators. In case of decentralized applications, it's actually, we, we also have logs. They are called uh, events. And the difference is that they are published to the public blockchain. So actually, it's like you have logs, but all other people also have your logs. And uh, that's why you shouldn't, of course, put some sensitive data in these logs, uh, but you should monitor them. Because in blockchain, it, when you find a, a vulnerability, it's always a race. Who's first? The owner of the contract that tries to fix the vulnerability or the hackers? So you should make sure that you respond. You have that incident response. In this case, event response, uh, in your, uh, in your applications. And actually, these can be some kind of microservices that are running on centralized servers. They don't have to be on the, on the blockchain. And, uh, Talking about the security alert and uh, fixing the security bugs. Well, in case of web applications, you can, this, uh, this is uh, the general concept. I'm sure, uh, I know that it's not that easy always, but you can uh, take down your application, patch it, like deploy the fix, and then uh, redeploy it, turn it on again. Uh, in case of decentralized applications, it's not that easy because w once you deploy the, f uh, the smart contract, you cannot just simply take it down. Uh, but the bug needs to be fixed. So the idea here is to, uh, and this, of course, uh, this is arguable, uh, but the idea is that you should fix the, the bug and then redeploy your whole, actually deploy again your all your smart contracts. And to avoid such problems, you should first uh, have a um, uh, functionality, some kind of mechanism that will allow you to stop the most sensitive functionalities in your smart contracts for some time. However, this mechanism cannot, uh, uh, it, it must still be able for people to access their assets, like for example, tokens. If your smart contract platform uh, has some tokens, uses tokens, 
you must allow the owners of these tokens to transfer it or to withdraw it, whatever. So only the functionality, the business logic should be uh, stopped. And also you should make sure that there is an upgrade process uh, for, for the contract, which allows you to deploy the contract again. Of course, there is no one great solution for that. There is no one upgrade process that solves all problems. This is, uh, this is invi individual, but for each uh, smart contract uh, platform, you should, uh, for each smart contract, you should uh, think over such process. So to sum up, uh, SCSVS is some, uh, well, we can say that it fills the gap of the ASVS in the decentralized applications uh, world. And I told you that we have that one uh, uh, known attacks category, number 13, which is actually a category that allows you to quickly check whether your uh, smart contract is vulnerable to well-known attacks in the decentralized world, of course. And actually, these are the requirements that are references to other requirements from other categories. So, for example, if you want to check whether you are vulnerable to silent falling sense and unchecked sense attacks, you just need to pass 4.6 and 4.7 requirements. So these are the requirements from the category number four. And if you want to make sure that you are not vulnerable to reentrancy attacks, you should make sure that you pass 4.5. Okay, so uh, the next plan, the future plan about the uh, SCSVS is to publish it uh, open source on GitHub, on our company's GitHub, and we're gonna do it on uh, the 1st of October. If you want to be informed about this, uh, you can either leave me a card after the presentation or just sign up under this uh, QR code. And of course, it's only used for SCSVS alert. That's not, uh, there's no any spam, uh, from, from this mailing list. And we are also considering, uh, running SCSVS under OWASP. Uh, and we would like to build a community around this project. Uh, so if you feel invited, if you'd like to contribute to, to, to the project when it's, uh, when it's on the GitHub uh, published, just, you know, uh, just contribute. Okay, so if you need a security audit, go for SCSVS from the 1st of October. And uh, as I said, if you need to be, if you want to be informed, just leave me your, uh, leave me your contact. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Mm -hmm. Just a second. Um, I wanted to give mine. Actually, oh. we don't need microphones here. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, you have a lot of uh, knowledge about uh, known vulnerabilities now, and I think that a lot of those are part of the Solidity language. Do you also uh, work together with um, creators of that language? Uh, no, I, I do not cooperate with them. However, well, it's a bit true because the... the the language is not very uh, secure, secure by design. Uh, however, there are other approaches, like, for example, Viper. There is a language for, for Ethereum, because I was mostly talking about Ethereum platform, uh, which uses Solidity uh, language. But there is also a Viper in Python uh, that trans, uh, translates your code into Solidity, but is uh, is a... Uh, has some mechanism that you know gives you uh, more secure code, and but also the the hack about else play was from EOS platform, which uh, uses a, C, a bit modified C plus uh, plus, so uh, they also have problems uh, that arise from the fact that uh, from from the C plus plus language. Uh, one of, uh, well. The, I think the good approach is with Cardano platform. They use uh, Plutus language, which is based on Haskell, a functional language. And uh, that w that's uh, a good approach, in my opinion, because you can easily formally verify such, uh, uh, such uh, contracts. Okay. Anybody else? But the simple answer is yes. Some of these are just because of the solidity. 
If there are no more questions left, then I would like to say thank you. Thank you.